Greetings. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Lee Byrne. And I'm, I'm absolutely delighted to be here, actually, to have the opportunity to share with you more about an insight into the anti-money laundering courses. Um, for those of you who've attended my workshops, you'll understand my first challenge is in 25 minutes to share with you what I believe is a really passionate and interesting area. The subject of AML is, when you look at it, it it's relatively new in terms of it, certainly the, the professionals of it. Uh, we go to the 1980s when the war on drugs was announced. The Americans in particular drove that. And then in 1990, we had the first model convention provided by the UN signed in Vienna, which gave us the concepts of conceal, arrange, possess, the proceeds of crime. In the following year, FATF was formed, Financial Action Task Force. And from them and subsequently, we've received guidance on what crime looks like. Actually, it's defined our role and responsibility. And that's been enormously powerful for us as academics and as professionals in the voc vocation of anti money laundering. And let's not forget the insignificant subject of countering the finance of terrorism. Most recently, in February 2012, they gave us the 40 recommendations. This moment in time is fabulously exciting for us because there's enormous change happening in the world in, in, in response to those requirements. And let's not forget the events of 9-11, the tragic events of 9-11, which really were a game changer in the war on terrorism. And I'm reminding of the anniversary of just Sunday past, 15 years. It is an era that where we know far more about now. We understand far more about the aims of a criminal. And the fact of the matter is, they are making astonishing levels of money and revenue. If we believe, and there is only guesstimates, the United Nations figures, something of the order of $2 trillion being generated by crime. We learned just last year that human trafficking is generating $150 billion. That counterfeiting is more, providing more revenue in Europe, according to Europol, than even drugs. It's constantly changing. What we aim to do on the courses is prepare and arm us as an industry to meet that challenge. And I often refer to it as the poacher and gamekeeper mentality. The poacher is incredibly bright, well-resourced. Our role and responsibility is to monitor their activities. And where we see knowledge or suspicion, to report that to the thin blue line, to law enforcement, to identify and seize and confiscate the proceeds of crime. It is a simple subject when you analyze and break it down. So, how do we do that? Well, we look at the sectors, the customers, the product lines we offer, and where we do business, the jurisdictions we enter into. Right now, you're seeing an awful lot of rhetoric about the UK. Historically, the U prejudicially, we might have considered the, the UK to be low risk. The fact of the matter is, in areas like the property sector, we're seeing a lot of noise that says, actually, we need to look within the city of London itself. It's proving attractive to the criminals. On the course, we start to ask the question, why is that the case? What is it that London is, why is London proving so attractive to the criminals, notwithstanding the enormous activity, the technology, and the qualification of skills that we've got in this room and wider in the city of London? Interestingly, in July, I read that how the ministers of parliament in Westminster were talking about the fact that they suspect that there's 100 billion pounds being laundered through the, the city of London. When you go to Transparency International reports, what they assert is actually a lot of that is ending up with the real estate. Actually, the city of Westminster is, in their view, and therefore around the Houses of Parliament, the number one location for funding from offshore anonymous companies. Is it true? I don't know. We just follow the journals and the commentary. But we do pay attention to this in our lessons, because what we're studying is real. This is absolutely an academic flavor, but we transcend that and take it to our workplace. And we never lose sight of the fact that our role as a professional body is to support law enforcement. And I think that's a critical factor of our lessons. Of course, it's not just the UK that's a threat, and we would, and you will have read with interest, the Panama Papers. And didn't we enjoy and monitoring and learning about the private affairs of the rich and famous? And to some extent, that's interesting and titillating, but the fact of the matter is, from the course perspective, we take that information and we unravel it, and then we start to analyze what the criminals are doing now. What do we learn from the Panama Papers? Those of you in industry long enough would know that's not the first expose of documents that ICIJ have had. They had two and a half million documents quite some time ago, and they gave us forms like secrecy for sale, 
and then we saw the puppet masters from the World Bank. We're going to cover these because actually understanding these sources of information inform us when we do our risk assessments at work. We take it back to the workplace and we say, this is what crime looks like. Be advised, be on guard. What we did learn from the Panama Papers, and is absolutely meaningful to us in our studies, is that they're using and misusing and abusing services provided by what we refer to as professional enablers, gatekeepers, lawyers, accountants, estate agents, people we can place third-party reliance upon, people who are educated. Now, the vast majority of those services are perfectly lawful and provided in the right way. But what's increasingly apparent is the criminals have identified and are able to contact with gatekeepers, professional enablers, who are on the dark side, dare I say, who aren't as lawful in their intentions. What we identify through using this secrecy, this veil of secrecy in these havens, through nominee services provided by trust and corporate service providers, they can disguise their identity. We're always bridging back to the aims of a criminal. A criminal does not want us to find them or their money. So they will do as much as they can to anonymize their contact. The use of nominee services is fabulous. Now here we have a very simple analogy and analysis and a demonstration of how Mr. E, who let's for the sake of argument say is a criminal, has divested his control of the business. The question is why has he done that? Well, because the criminals monitor what we do. They know our standards. FATF has devised that at 25%, we should not only identify the owners of legally formed persons and arrangements, but take steps to verify that information. Well, if I know you're going to ask for me my details, my passport, my payslip, my address details, etc., my source of funds, source of wealth details at 25%, then I'll present a scenario in the hope that you stop at level one and don't drill down. Actually, if you do drill down, you identify that Mr. E, on both sides of this um, layering and structure, his cumulative ownership and control is 40%. It is a very, very simple demonstration of what the criminals are doing because they understand what we do. We take that forward in the workshops in a meaningful fashion. The issues we try and address is, well, how do I, on a practical level, conduct that activity in havens of secrecy? What exactly am I looking for? And therein lies the issue. And one of the issues is that we need to improve our knowledge and constantly address and, and monitor the changes in their form and conduct. I mentioned before how counterfeiting and human trafficking are new sources of revenue, it would appear. We are always looking to identify the risks presented by criminals and terrorist financiers and proliferators. Therefore, in all our courses, we will address the issue of risk-based approach. What exactly does that mean? How do I do the risk identification process? And what does it mean to analyze and then manage and mitigate? Now, the fact of the matter is the FCA, in their report from October in 2014, when they did their last thematic review of how small firms are monitoring this issue and managing this issue, found that 50% of the firms could not articulate and confirm to them that risk assessment process. Now, I found that really quite alarming because what this suggests to me is people either can't do it, don't know how to do it, or more likely, in, in many occasions, they're not resourced to do it. Either way, there's an opportunity for us as academics to cl close and bridge that gap. And that's our aim and aspiration. We're certainly looking at new technology. The world is changing. There is globalization, new technology. Criminals seize upon that. Actually, a lot of it is done for social and economic advantage. But we'll look at mobile phone technologies and also this is subject of virtual currencies. Now, some of you may well be into this in a heavier way than I am. I'm, for me, it's an area of, of, of concern and I'm looking at it quite heavily at the moment. But virtual currency is here to stay, much to the annoyance of some of the regulators, to be truthful. Ostrap reported that actually they would watch, adopt a watching brief on virtual currency rather in the hope that it would go away. Here, the EBA in Europe said they would touch it with a barge pole. And that was the response at that time. But we've just seen in July, they reversed that position. An interest development on the fourth year directive says that now, currency exchanges are now going to be obliged entities. Well, what does that mean to our workplace? Well, it means that if you have a virtual currency exchange on your books, they should now be 
complying with the fourth EU directive, it suggested. So we're going to take on board these new challenges and start to unwrap the sophistication, the technology of them. We're certainly not going to advocate making new IT development people. That's just not going to happen. But what we need to understand is how they're moving value through that form, that medium. Because it's part of the products and services that our customers are offering. The courses make you go into areas that are a stretch. It's very deliberate. We are, as I mentioned, part of a process right now in undertaking and monitoring a huge amount of review and analysis from the tutor team to inform and update the courses in response to regulatory changes. The fourth EU directive was provided last year. Then it was amended in January, February. It's just been amended again in response to terrorism attacks in Paris and Nice and Belgium. The fabulous thing is that if you're on this course right now, you're going to be required and forced to observe and read those changes. You will know as much as your bosses. Now, that's incredibly powerful and empowering. I joined the ICA in 2010 in an event like this. I wasn't working for them at the time. I had 20 years financial services. I decided to start to professionalize and get the certification the ICA offered in respect of AML. And from that point forward, I grew and understood more and more about change. I found the course incredibly empowering because staff would ask me questions, I'd know the answer. That wasn't true before I did the certification. So on a personal level, I am a student of the ICA before I joined them three years ago. I did the diploma. And hopefully you were reassured to know I passed it, which is quite good, yeah. <laughs> With distinction, he says. <laughs> Aren't I a proud boy right now? Um, CDD and beneficial ownership. I'm going to dwell on that in, in a bit more detail in a moment. I've always did, already touched upon the beneficial ownership piece. The spin that we give differently in the lessons is... Why do criminals take advantage of legal arrangements and legal persons? Yes, I can do it through a natural person engagement. But what are the dynamics of the legally formed person that are so attracted to them that makes them go to the extra, the extra yard and mile to form businesses? Well, it's because they can move all value, quite frankly. The wealth range is not constrained by their salary. They can go international and they can take advantage of trade finance. Now, we have to apply sanctions or observe sanctions requirements. You've seen an awful lot of enforcement action, principally from the US authorities around this area. So we break that down into what are sanctions? What's the point? And then how do you make sure that you and your firm do not fall foul of those expectations? And an interesting area I just want to dwell on briefly is trade finance. It's an area I hold dear at the moment. Because trade finance was historically considered very low risk. For those who are not familiar with trade finance, you get a bundle of documents that appears to support the movement of value in goods around the world. Because of globalization, trade finance has just gone through the roof. And that's fabulous. It means that we can send our goods around the world, import, export. People make a lot of money. Banks make a lot of money. Very lucrative. But then we've got the criminals and the financiers of terrorism. And they realize that actually the banks don't inspect the goods or the cargo. For those of you who understand trade finance, it would appear neither do customs and excise, because less than 2% of the containers are being inspected or screened. So the odds are stacked in favor of the criminal, because they can send containers around the world, allegedly holding goods that the financial flows are supporting, when in fact it's an empty box. We look at trade finance in some detail on most of our courses, because if I was laundering money right now, I'd be doing it through trade finance. Astonishing levels of money are moving through trade finance. We'll develop that. And actually, notwithstanding just the financial flows and the, the problem with what's in the box, we've got the concept of dual-use goods and proliferation. Most people will be familiar with the concept of weapons of mass destruction, chemical, nuclear, biological. We've seen events just in the last week with North Korea exploding their, 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 their nuclear devices. But dual-use goods is somewhat on the left field. It's goods that were good, but could be used bad. Is this a dual-use good? No, I could throw it at you and it might hurt. And that's fairly harmful. But if I strip the back off, I've got batteries inside. The batteries are a power source for an IED. Now it becomes interesting. And in some jurisdictions, some commodities, you need license to move those goods. If I'm a financial services firm and my clients are moving goods around the world, I've now got tripwires all over the place. What we'll do on the course is we'll start to unwrap those concerns and help you to understand how to manage those issues. What is the framework of systems and controls that you need to embed to make sure you protect your business? Actually, why don't you protect society? So, the qualifications are deliberately aimed from entry level 
I started at certificates because I needed to understand the glossary of AML and financial crime, and we went on to advance and diploma level. And as Phil pointed out, for the postgraduate level, which is a very senior leadership. CDD, I mentioned I'd come back to it. I'm terribly excited by a course we've launched in the last 12 months that I think is pretty much new market territory. Um, at advanced level, we have customer due diligence. Customer due diligence is the cornerstone of our controls. It's fundamental that we understand who a client is so we can map what would unusual looks like. That's important. So how do we do that? Well, we can provide you the theory and we provide you with the rules. But what this course does and what we endeavour to do then replicate in the other courses is give you a bunch of documents to say, what do you see? Scrutinise those documents. What are the red flags? What are the indicators? How do you conduct due diligence? The course that supports that now, I think, is, is, is terribly exciting. Um, Take-up rate has been fantastic. Tier 1 Bank's terribly excited by it as well. If you are somebody in the space of customer due diligence right now, and you're looking for certification of your competence, I think this could be quite a meaningful course for you. We do, of course, do the mainstream courses, and they're very good. That's just a little extra on the subject of CDD. Very meaningful course. And it fits there in the middle of what is a hierarchy of learning. We know that certificated lending, um, lending, he says, um, certificated um, learning is important. It's entry level. It gives you the glossary, the acronyms. Some of you may well be law enforcement, looking to bridge into private sector practice. Um, it, it gives you the feel for the language, which sometimes can be disorientated. And then we build through the levels of terms of length of, of time that the course takes and how granular we get with the material and the learning. When you arrive at diploma level, which I, I think is an outstanding course, I truly do, I think it's a world leader, you really do get preparation for management, and where you are a manager, it starts to inform and help you to become a better manager. I achieved the status of an MRO, and I did that because of my diploma course. I was approved by the FSA at that time. That would not have happened without my certification. The fact of the matter is I was making decisions at work one day, and I understood them sufficiently to do them right. So one of the ethos is that Bill Howarth is, holds dear and, and was part of the, the, the whole development of the ICA was to improve professional standards. As a tutor team, we are acutely aware of our responsibility not to give you just the theory, but really in the workshops that Becker talked about is to share and harvest best practice around the world so you learn from one another. And I think that's quite powerful. Okay, I'm going to give you one final taste of what you might expect on our courses. I'm often challenged by students to say, OK, Lee, great theory. Yes, I've read some press, but give me something that's meaningful, tangible, that demonstrates just how financial services is exposed to these risks. And every so often, law enforcement, the governments, provide us with what I think is gold dust. Um, some of you may, may, may be familiar with this case. It's the Lebanese Canadian Bank. OK, so what is the story? Well, there's an area in South America called Colombia, and they grow something called cocaine. You might be familiar with this commodity. Apparently, it's illegal in most jurisdictions of the world. Now, they can ship it straight into the US, but they also target the European market, because apparently Europeans quite like it. How do you do that? Well, you ship it through the cocaine route, which is into the sub saharan area of Africa, Nigeria, which is my neck of the woods, where my bank was domiciled. Nigerian street gangs are really quite fierce, very, very effective. They give it safe passage as it passes through Africa into the soft underbelly of the Mediterranean, Spain, Albania, Italy. And they land it on the shores of Europe and they sell it. It's very lucrative. It generates large sums of cash. Now, the days when you walked into the branches of a high street bank with a big bag of cash and said, would you please accept that deposit, hopefully have long gone. So they have a dilemma. Huge amounts of cash revenue generation they what to do with it. So what they do is they pass it back, it would transpire, through the same safe passage that they moved the drugs through. It's quite sensible. But they still have to bank it. They still want to get it into the regulated sector. They don't have to. They could leave it in the unregulated sector with the Awala does, and they do. But they do also need to bring it into the regulated sector if they want to buy things with it. So what to do with it? Well, they commingle it. They bank it with the sales of luxury cars that have been imported from North America. Trade finance appears again for the first time. So they bank it in Lebanese exchange houses, in jurisdictions like Benin, with its diaspora Lebanese population. The money then gets banked 
through the regulated sector and exchange houses, some of it features, most of it goes onto the Lebanese Canadian Bank, which has accounts in North America and around the world. Actually, part of that is diverted off to Hezbollah. Now, that's a designated entity in most jurisdictions of the West, at least. So now we've got drugs money from the Colombians passed through the hands of Nigerians, sold at market with drug dealers in Europe, financing terrorism. The balance of it, well, that ships around to buy the luxury cars from North America, or else goes to China, where they buy household consumables, electronic devices, which are shipped, again, through trade finance, into the markets of South America. The proceeds of sales of those goods, guess where they go? The back pocket of the Colombians, thereby completing a virtuous circle. The fact of the matter is this was just one case study that was disclosed to us. Upwards of $200 million a month going through this. Astonishing levels of finance and revenue. Five continents of the world, drugs, cash, terrorism, trade finance, luxury cars, household consumables. This is the type of deal, case study we start to unwrap. How did that happen? Regrettably, most of what we do is retrospective and reactive, but we try and inform to start to step forward and take steps to mitigate those risks going forward. One case study. So, almost on time. I'm bringing the show home. I just want to introduce to you the rest of the training faculty. Now, you've met Becker already. Um, obviously, the common denominator here is not that we all have Hollywood good looks. You've probably worked that out by now. But we're actually very fortunate to have Andy Dawn, who regrettably is not here today, and Tim with us. When you look at the biographies of our trainers, they're all practitioners. Tim just recently joined us from the Gambling Commission. We're delighted to have seduced him onto our training team. Andy is former law enforcement. Bribery and corruption is specialization there. Dawn is a nominated officer. Capital markets, market abuse is a concern. And for me, it's retail banking and former head of compliance of financial crime. What I want you to leave you with is a message. You, like me in 2010, when I sat in a room like this with the ICA making a really important decision. Most of you will be self-financing. It's a big decision. All I can give you is commitment from the tutor team that the course materials will endeavor to make sure they're cutting edge. And on a personal level, we're absolutely committed to your success. <laughs>